God is good. He's worthy of praise. What has God been doing in your life this week? As you worship, as you sing, as you receive the message, I just encourage you to reflect on how does it connect with what God's doing in your life right now. For each and every one of us, we're in this journey and things, things are happening to us. Positive things are happening to us. Unfortunately, not so positive things are happening to us. And how does God want to use your time gathering together to minister to you, to build your faith, to strengthen your resolve, to give you encouragement? There is a message in what we sing and what we hear from the, from the word this evening for each and every one of us. So let's stand together as we worship. Father God, we just receive what you have for us. We know that you are active and that your spirit is working in each and every one of our hearts and minds. That you're drawing us to you, that you're revealing the mysteries of heaven, and that you're building up faith. You're strengthening our resolve. You're, you're giving us courage to fight the good fight. And so we just receive that as we declare that you are doing great things in our life. Captain, 
Break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, wake in alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. God, you do great things. faith and hope and trust in you, Lord, that you do great things. Amen. Faithful you have been, and faithful you will be. Yeah. 
I will. Yes, we will choose to praise and to glorify and magnify the name of all names, the overcomer, seated, seated in the heavens on the throne.
you did. We praise you are wonderful. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'm one of the pastors here at Quest. I want to welcome you, whether you're joining us here in person or if you're joining us online, we are glad that you chose to spend your time today with us in worship. Um, I want to begin, uh, whether you're joining us online or you're here in person, inside your bulletin is a Connect card or on our website um, is a place you can fill that out online. Um, it just has a place so we can get some information from you. It's just our way of staying up to date with you. No one's going to show up at your house or anything like that. But we just encourage you, whether you're a first-time guest or a uh, a regular attendee here at Quest uh, that you'd fill that out. Again, that's just our way of staying up to date with you. So a few announcements today to share with all of you. First of all, we'd like to say thank you to everyone who participated in the blood drive that happened this past Wednesday. Uh, you made a great impact on those in our community, and it is, didn't go unnoticed. So again, thank you for participating in that. Second of all, we are going to be uh, making care packs to send to college students and to military personnel. Um, that's coming up over the course of the next month. And so we are looking for donations of individually wrapped snacks. Um, and so we are collecting those by Sunday, November 8th. So if you'd like to participate, we encourage you to bring those in. And then we are also participating in Operation Christmas Child this year. Um, if you've been part of this in the past, you kind of know how the routine is. You pick up a box, uh, and then you're able to fill it. Um, so boxes are available in the lobby here at Quest, and you can pick one of those up today. And the boxes are due back by November 15th. Then lastly, for those of you who are joining us online, or those of you who may be a kid at heart uh, that are here with us in person, uh, we encourage you to check out our Facebook Live Worship for our Quest Kids message from Pastor Jessica Dolan. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Pastor Bill Walker, who will be sharing today's message. Well, thank you, Adrian. Let's uh, begin with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence, your guidance, uh, your word, who you are, who you will be. We just ask for your presence here for the rest of this, this evening as we continue to learn about your word and then worship together. Continue to guide us and lead us and take us to places that we cannot go on our own. And we say this and we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, Stephen Covey is an American educator and author, and he wrote a book called The uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective, uh, Highly Successful People. And that book alone sold over 30 million copies. And one of the things that he says, one of his mantras is this, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. Covey's quote can be applied to almost anything we do in life, whether it's remodeling a house uh, tackling a project at work, taking a vacation, playing a sport, raising kids. And Kobe writes this specifically when he talks about beginning with the end in mind. He said, to begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. It means to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now and so that the steps you take are always in the right direction. About 2,000 years before Covey said this, Paul made a similar statement. It's a little bit shorter, but I think even more powerful. And he wrote to the church that was the uh, a call to say. And in the letter to the Colossians, Paul writes these words. He said, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of, of God. To paraphrase it, think about heaven. But how often do we think about heaven? How often do we plan for heaven? How often do we turn our thoughts or our imaginations or our discussions about the place where we desire to spend eternity? 
Over 23 years ago, Time magazine published an extensive article entitled, Does Heaven Exist? And the writer documented three facts. First of all, and again, this is 23 years ago, the first thing he said was preachers preach on heaven much less than in the past. I think that trend has continued. And he said, while the second fact that he took from this study was that while a large majority of people believe it exists, most have no idea what it's really like or what it really is about. And the third thing that the author gleaned from this study was this. Almost nobody thinks its existence changes the way we live here. Imagine that almost no one thinks that its existence really changes how we live our lives today. How often do we today talk about heaven in church or in our small groups or in the conversations we have with our families? I think not enough. So today we're going to begin a new sermon series, and it's called Heaven and Hell and Everything in Between. We're going to talk about heaven, we're going to talk about hell, and then we're going to talk about being on this earth and what that has to do with both heaven and hell. Statistics show that 65% of people believe that heaven exists. That means over a third of people think that it doesn't. So if we're truly going to begin with the end in mind, if we truly set our hearts on things above, we need to talk about how and where our lives will end up. Or at least where we hope they'll end up. What we experience in this temporary life on this earth is only a prelude to the eternity that we'll spend in heaven. What we do on this earth will affect if we get into heaven or how we'll get into heaven, and there's only one way, and what will happen once we get into heaven. We're going to talk about some of those things today, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin by talking about heaven itself. Today, I want to look at eight realities of heaven, eight realities of heaven. Now, these are not the eight realities, are the only eight realities. I had a list of about 15 or 20 things I could have talked about. I felt led to talk about these eight things, but there's many, many, many more. So when we're talking about heaven, one of the realities of heaven is this. Heaven is a real place. Heaven is a real place. It's not a state of mind, nor does it only exist in our imagination or in our thoughts. Heaven is a real place tangible place. Jesus says these words is recorded in the uh, book of John. He said, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you, a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, heaven's a place. Jesus taught his disciples to pray the Lord's prayer. The prayers are directed, our father who art in heaven. Heaven is a real place. Secondly, when we talk about the realities of heaven, heaven is really misunderstood and ununderstood. I made up that word, ununderstood. I'm going to explain what it means in just a few minutes. But heaven is really misunderstood and ununderstood. Some years ago, a friend of mine, it's been quite a few years ago, I went to high school, he went to the Indianapolis 500 every single year. He went with his dad's friends, and they would make it an annual tradition. At one time, there were so many, they would rent a motorhome, they would go, they would watch the race. As people were making their way out, they would stay and grill out steaks and things like that. And gradually, the amount of his uh, dad's friends that were going dwindled, so they had, had extra tickets. So for years, my friend asked me if I wanted to go to the Indianapolis 500. He asked me, and he asked another one of our mutual friends if he wanted to go. And both, both, both myself and our other friend... Both of us said, no, we don't want to go to the Indianapolis 500 because we don't want to watch cars go around in a circle. Boring. Every year he asked us, every year he asked us. Finally, my other friend relented, and he went to the Indianapolis 500. And later he called me up and he said, uh, Bill, it was amazing. He said, watching cars go around in circles. He goes, oh, it's much more than that. It was just, you can't believe it. You have to go next year. You have to go. You have to go. And so finally, after a couple years, I relented, and I said, I will go watch cars go around the track in a circle. I had no frame of reference of what I was going to see. So we got there. We left. I remember it was 3.30 in the morning. We met. We ate at an all-night breakfast place. And then we got to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway by 6 o'clock when they shoot this big uh, 
big a blast that goes off that signals the gate's going to open. We poured into the great gate, which only gets you into the parking lot, for a race that I think began five hours later at 11 o'clock. And I looked around, and the place was crowded. You know, I had seen crowds before. And I noticed the raceway. And the raceway, uh, the stands went pretty high, but not nearly as high as they do at Ohio State Stadium. But they were fairly high. It was not super impressive, but I thought, OK. So then we began to make our way into the, uh, into the track itself. And we went underneath through the stairway, OK, the, through the stands. So we had to go through the stands. And then we got near the track, and then we started walking up to the stands to take our seats. And I got up there, I sat down, and I looked around, and I couldn't believe how big that track was. I mean, it's two and a half miles, and I thought all two and a half miles, but just to see that track and how big it was, I just, it was impressive. It really was. And I was also impressed by how many people were there. Uh, it's been estimated that with the, uh, the grandstand seats and the infield seats that were once present, the, the attendance has gone down lately, but used to be, and when I was going, I think it peaked in attendance, 400,000 people would watch that race. 400,000 people, about 100,000 fit in Ohio State Stadium. 400,000 people go there. So we got in, I'm looking around, then they had these parades that last, this parade that lasted for, I don't know, 45 minutes before the race with all these dignitaries that went around and famous people and Hollywood actors and actresses, and we're only about, probably about 40 or 50 yards from them, maybe even closer up in the stands, you can see them all, you don't need binoculars, that's going on. Regis Philbin was there, I yelled, Regis! And he looked at me and waved, it was exciting, right? And, uh, and then they had the, the motorcycle riders from the Indianapolis uh, Police Department, the, motor, uh, the ones that rode motorcycles, and they, they did it. They stood up on their motorcycles and rode them with their arms folded. They did that every year. They said, I was pretty impressed. And then, then the race started. And the pace car started, and it takes the cars around in a lap. And, and I said, wow, uh, you know, the, we were in turn four, and if we looked out, we could see down the, down the raceway, we could see the start of the race, but they came all the way around one turn, one, two, three, back into turn four. By the time they got to us, those cars were cooking. They were going fast. I go, wow, those cars are really moving. They said, Bill, you haven't seen anything yet. They took another warm-up lap together. The cars were faster. The third lap, they were a little bit faster. And then in the fourth lap, they let the pace car get really far ahead of them. And all of a sudden, I heard these cars. And I couldn't believe how fast they were going. It was literally like this. Meow, woo, woo. They were going, bye, bye, quick, quick. And I'm going... Wow, I had never seen cars move that fast. I mean, the cars were going over 200 miles an hour. Now, if you're on the expressway going 70 and a car passes you going 90, it's moving 20 miles an hour past you. But these cars, I was stationary, they were going over 200 miles an hour. I, could, I couldn't even make out the numbers at first. I had never seen anything like it. I mean, I drive a Prius, right? Unbelievable. You see, my problem was I had a flawed frame of reference I had seen pictures of the race on TV. I had seen pictures of the track. Totally misunderstood it. Misunderstood what was going on. There's misunderstanding and there's also ununderstanding. And ununderstanding occurs when we have no frame of reference. When we misunderstand something, we do. But when we ununderstand, we don't. And I went to that first Indy 500 with this flawed frame of reference. But sometimes... There are things that exist that we truly ununderstand, and such is heaven. What on earth compares to heaven? What's our frame of reference? Well, we know that heaven exists, but the challenge is it's totally undiscovered by human eyes. You have to be God or Jesus or an angel or a heavenly being to be there or else dead. Nobody reports back from what heaven's like. I mean, we hear glimpses of it from the Bible, but they're only glimpses. The Discovery Channel has never done, to the best of my knowledge, sent a film crew to heaven to, talk, to take an inside look at heaven, right? They've gone to Everest, the highest peak. They've gone into the lowest part of the, the oceans, but nobody has ever reported back on heaven through a documentary. Again, we get glimpses of it in the Bible, but they're only glimpses. It's ununderstanding. We can't even begin to fathom how incredible it is. You know, I've been to a lot of funerals, and many people who have never professed faith in Jesus Christ, I hear things like this. Well, that person is looking down on us from heaven right now. Really? 
Or if the person was a golfer, they'll say, oh, they're, they're in the big golf course in the sky, breaking par every day, and everybody will laugh, and I'm thinking, well, that's theologically inaccurate. It's just wrong. And we try to take what we have on this earth and jam it into our definition of what it, it's like in heaven, but it simply never works out. A lot of misunderstandings about heaven. We're going to be clearing some of those up, hopefully, in the next few weeks. Third reality about heaven is this. It's really hard to get into. Really hard to get into. I got your attention now, don't I? I want to say something. This is important. The two worst things I could do tonight are judge people. I don't judge people. That's not what I do. But the other thing that I need to do is to be brutally honest with people. So I don't want to judge anybody, but I need to be brutally honest. And if we look at Matthew chapter 7, we're going to be looking at the words of Jesus throughout the, the book of Matthew. Matthew, by the way, was Jewish, and he wrote for a Jewish audience. And Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. And the fact that Matthew is Jewish and wrote for a Jewish audience is going to be important. And you'll see that in just a while. But, but this is what, uh, this is what uh, Jesus says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then he goes on and he says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Well, that's a pretty impressive uh, uh, list of things they're doing, right? What a resume. Prophesize in your name, drive out demons, do miracles. Those are great things, but the problem is that person, those people don't really know Jesus Christ. They're doing the things of Jesus without knowing Jesus himself. And then he goes on, and this is the gut punch. Listen to what Jesus says. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoer. What? Doing these great things in Jesus' name, but they don't know Jesus Christ. Jesus also says these words. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only few find it. Wow. Small gate, narrow road. It's really, really hard to get into heaven. And finally, again in Matthew, Jesus says these words. He said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And all you are thinking, oh, I'm not rich. Uh, that's those rich, you know how those rich people are. Well, the truth of the matter is, if you're alive in the United States, compared to the rest of the world today, you are filthy rich. If you have a, a roof over your head, if you have three square meals a day, if you have access to halfway decent health care, you are filthy rich. We are so much better off than most of the world today. I am filthy rich. I am filthy rich because I have all of those things. See, Jesus wrote to a Jewish audience, and why this is so kind of a, he cuts to the chase right away is because of this. All the Jewish people thought they were going to heaven, right? If you're Jewish, you went to heaven. If you weren't Jewish, if you were Gentile, you did it. But, but Jesus kind of shakes things up, and he says, it's not about being Jewish. It's about your heart. It's about your heart toward me. That got people's attention, and that's one of the things that got Jesus crucified. They didn't like what he was saying. Fourth thing that we, when we talk about heaven, heaven is really amazing. We needed some good news after that, didn't we? Heaven is really amazing. Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Church says this, heaven's out of this world. <laughs> heaven is out of this world. That's a pretty good description. When my kids were growing up, and uh, I used to tell them this, I used to tell them that heaven is better than Disneyland or Disney World. You know, heaven is better than Disney. Man, that got att their attention, especially once we went to Disney World. We went there one time, and we're heaven's better than this. And I've said that before, and you, you might have heard me, remember me saying that here at Quest. And I said that about a couple months ago. We had just started our online services. I said that, and I heard from one of the moms here. And she had small children, and the family was watching the sermon together. And the adults are watching, but the kids aren't really paying attention to my preaching, not because it isn't interesting, it's because they're too young, okay? So they're just kind of playing around and stuff like that, but the family's gathered together. Okay, that's good. And then suddenly I say, heaven is better than Disney World. She said, both her kids stopped and said, what? 
What, did you hear what? Really? Heaven is better than Disney? It got their attention. Yeah, heaven is better than Disney World. When I said that, they really started to pay attention. Listen to what, uh, what Paul, greatest missionary ever lived, wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament. This is what he says, and he actually quotes the Old Testament, uh, the book of Isaiah, and he says this. This is what scriptures meant, mean when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love them. Now, I think God has prepared things on this earth for those who love him, but I think this is also talking about a heaven we can't even imagine. Begin to imagine how amazing heaven it is. And, and Paul, I think, had a better insight into heaven than most of us. And then he writes this. He really gets it. This is, this is how much he looks forward to going to heaven. And, and this is when he writes to the church at Philippi. And he was, in all probability, he was probably in jail when he wrote this. And he says this, uh, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, then this will mean fruitful labor, labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But if it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, so be it. So what he says, he's so looking forward to heaven, but he realizes God has work for him to do on this earth. So he says, I can't lose. If I stay alive, I'm doing work for the Lord. That's great, but far better. The best I could do, and this guy's a missionary. He's affected hundreds, thousands of people through what he says, and man, he's just knocking it out of the park in ministry, but he says, you know what? It'd be better if I was dead personally because I could be with Jesus then. Wow. Paul gets it, doesn't he? Doesn't it? Suppose there was someone I knew that had died, and I know a lot of people that have died, but we'll just uh, not say anybody specifically, but they're in heaven, and they're listening to the sermon, right? And they've got some of their friends, and they're gathered, and theologically, we're just, we're just imagining this. I'm not saying this is possible. Let's just put on our imagination caps, and, and they hear this sermon, and all of a sudden, I get a call from this person, right? And I think the conversation would go, this is somebody in heaven now calling me after they hear me preach this sermon. They say, hey, Bill, we just heard your sermon, and we really appreciate how you tried so hard to really tell people how it is up here and how truly amazing it is. Uh, but to be honest with you, Bill, you didn't even come close. It's much better than you could even begin to describe, Bill. It really is. But, but Bill, thanks Thanks for trying. Thanks for trying. We really appreciate it. But again, Bill, when it comes to heaven, you tried hard, but you're simply clueless. And I could say, clueless? Well, how could I begin to understand how wonderful heaven is? And the person says, well, Bill, when, remember when you went to that first Indy 500 race and how wrong you were? You know, take that times 100 million. You're not even close. You can't even begin to imagine what's going on up here. And then wouldn't it be funny if that person that called me from heaven said, oh, and by the way, Bill, I'll see you next week. That was a joke. That means I died, right? It means I'm in a better place. I believe if, if each one of us could only maybe when we're, I don't know, 10 or 15 years old or maybe older or maybe younger, if we could only just spend 30 seconds in heaven, just, just experience heaven for 30 seconds, everybody in the world I think everybody, just about everybody in the world would end up going to heaven. We just can't experience it here on earth. The book of Revelation says this. It says every tear will be wiped from our eyes. Heaven is perfect. There's going to be, uh, there's going to be great things there. No sickness, no heartache, no pain, no mistrust, no anger, no self-centeredness, no wanting to get even, no short tempers, no suffering, no mourning, nothing. Heaven is going to be a perfect place. The thing when we talk about the reality of heaven, heaven is big. It's real big. It has unlimited seating capacity. We don't have to worry about heaven being filled up. Yes, it's hard to get into, but heaven is self-limiting, not limiting by God, but it's limited by us in what we do. God does not limit or prevent anybody from getting into heaven 
Those are, it's done by the choices that we make. Second Peter uh, 3, 9, Peter writes this. He tells us that God doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone. Church planner Mark Bain from the Church of Nazarene, he's a head of church planning for the Church of the Nazarene. He says when he plants a, a church, here's what he's trying to do, depopulate hell. He says, I want to depopulate hell. And we've already seen these words of Jesus in the gospel, right? He writes uh, this again. We, we've talked about this. My father's house has many rooms, not just a couple, but many rooms. And when Jesus said this back in his day, when Jesus lived, oftentimes the father uh, of the family would build a, build a house and he became the patriarch of that family. And his, his sons would get married. Oftentimes, if they had the land, they would simply build on additional rooms for every son that got married and they had enough room Sometimes they had these little mini compounds that existed over and over again. So when Jesus says, in my father's house has many rooms, what he's really saying is, God can always add more rooms for us. There's plenty of room here. Whether we make it or not, it's up to us. Lots of space. Lots of space. That's good news, isn't it? The sixth reality of heaven uh, is this. Heaven is a place with real rewards. Heaven is a place with real rewards. Now, now, don't get me wrong. Dwelling with Christ and with God in and, and heaven, that's, that's the best reward we could get. That's the ultimate reward. But the Bible also mentions other rewards uh, that we receive in heaven. Sometimes they're called inheritances or maybe a treasure. And, and listen to these uh, things that will be waiting for us in heaven. In Matthew 5, 12, we're told this. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. In 1 Peter, first chapter, Peter writes this. He talks about an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade away, is kept in heaven for you based upon what you did on this earth. And then Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, going back to that book again, he says this, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. We're going to be rewarded in heaven for what we do on this earth and what we do to serve Christ. If you clean the church this week, you'll be rewarded to heaven. If you cut the grass this week or tended to the flowers or if you're going to teach in kid zone or if you painted or greeted, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. If you read a Bible story to your child or helped set up the sound system or carry chairs or folded bulletins, or help with worship in any way, you will be rewarded in heaven. Now this is important though. We will get rewards in heaven. The, the Bible's clear about this. But heavenly and even earthly rewards are the byproducts of our life in Jesus Christ, but not our goal. We mentioned that earlier. They're the byproducts of our life in Christ, not the goal. We're going to get those. See, our goal is Jesus Christ himself. The goal is to, for us to get to Jesus and to, for Jesus to get to us. It's the same goal that's on this earth. It's the same goal that's in heaven. Christ himself. Seventhly, when we talk about the reality of heaven, heaven is this, our real home. Our real home. We talk about, as pastors, we talk about people going home when they die at funerals if they're a Christian. And I th I've thought about this. Heaven is my home, and I've never been there. It's my real home. This isn't my home, and this place isn't my home. And you know what? I love my house. I love my physical house. I love coming home. I love sitting on my couch. I love my bed. I lo Man, I love my house, but it's not my home. Heaven is. And it, whether we live on this earth a short time or a long time, in the scheme of things, it's really a very small amount of time because heaven is our real home. Paul, again, writes to the church of Philippi, and he says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And he doesn't say we will be citizens of heaven. What he's saying to those who are saved, he says, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. And in Hebrews 13, 14, we hear the writer tell us this, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. 
It's not our home. It won't last. It's temporary. We're just passing through for a while until we get to where we're going to spend eternity. And finally, that brings up point number eight. Heaven is really forever. Really forever. We talk about forever. I'll love you forever. This will last forever on this earth. There's no forever on this earth. Forever is in heaven. Forever is eternity. It's really forever. In 2 Corinthians, again, Paul writes the church of Corinth. You know, a lot of this talk about heaven has to do with Paul, and I think one of the reasons was because he was a rascal. He went around supervising the arrest and probably the killing of Christians before he became a Christian. And man, he thinks about heaven a lot more than most people do because he saw where he came from. And he went, when he writes to that church at Corinth, he says this. He says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. One of those things is heaven. It's going to last forever. The truth of the matter is, thinking on heaven, thinking on heaven can be life-changing and life-giving. It's a good thing. It's a topic we often avoid, but we shouldn't. It gives life. It changes life. Thinking about heaven takes our, our eyes and our minds off the stuff of the world, and not that these things aren't important at times, but there are infinitely more important things that are out there that we need to concentrate on. I'm going to close with a, a quote from Rick Warren. And he says this, listen to these words. He's the pastor of Saddleback Church. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life. Rick Warren says this, and just listen to these words. You will not be in heaven two seconds before you cry out, why did I place so much importance on things that were so temporary? What was I thinking? Why did I waste so much time energy and concern on what wasn't going to last. And I think that's what heaven does for us. If we can even begin to imagine what it's going to be like and how important it is and how important it is for us to, to get there ourselves and to get as many people as we can there ourselves, it will change the way that we look at this world right now. You know, when I was writing the sermon together, we're in the midst of this COVID stuff going on and all this the news that Ohio's got the highest number, you know, all that's going on. As many of you know, uh, my wife is battling breast cancer. All this stuff is going, and, and you're thinking about these things. Then I start thinking about heaven. I think, wow, wow. Not that those things aren't important on this earth, but what's really important is dwelling in heaven at the right hand of the Father and the Son forever. That's what it's ultimately about. That's why we're here. We want to get as many people into heaven, and we want to get as many people here to take as many people as they can with them to heaven. That's, what we, that's why we exist as a church. That's what we strive to do. So this week, I challenge you, I want you to do something that maybe you won't normally do because you're thinking of heaven. You're thinking of the future. You're thinking of eternity. Go out and do something. Say something. Have a conversation. Whatever God moves you to do, do something because heaven is real and heaven exists, and see what happens. Let's pray. Father God, we know that you're real. We know you sent your son upon this earth, and he's real. We know that your Holy Spirit is here among us, and he's real. And we know, too, that heaven is real. But just because we can't see it, sometimes because we can't imagine it, sometimes because we don't think about it, Father, just... Don't allow that to, to keep us from just pausing and turning our eyes and our minds and our hearts upon you and upon the things you have for us for eternity in heaven, Father. Allow us to look at heaven as a, as a destination and allow us to, to look at heaven in a way that would, would, would cause us to change what we do and how we think and how we interact with people and who we are as your church. Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for the sacrifice that he made on the cross. I thank you that on the third day he rose from the dead. And I thank you that after 40 days he ascended into heavens and is waiting there for each one of us. Just continue to take us and, and mold us and remind us of our final destination, our destination for eternity. Amen. Amen.
Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for being with us uh, online. And uh, we ask you to now, we're going to stand together as we sing our closing song. You are the only king forever. Worthy of our praise. We lift you high. God, firm foundation, our rock, the only solid God, as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once sung now shaken, we trust forever in your name, the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are unmatched in all that you do. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love, just as you will reign, and every knee will bow. Amen. Bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Oh, we trust the name of Jesus, because you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only Forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. Victorious. banner high. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. We lift your banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age you reign. Your kingdom has no end. You are the only king forever, forever. God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore, forevermore. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Yes, you are victorious. We praise your name. We praise your name. For you are victorious, the only king forever. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed evening. So good to worship with you. You're just
Hey friends, Pastor Jess here. Today I have a maze for us to do together. Will you help me get to the top of the mountain? Awesome. We did it, although I did get a little confused for a moment. Did you notice on the activity page that Jesus was standing at the top of that mountain? Today, we will hear about a time that he went up a mountain with some of his disciples to show them something wonderful. This week, we'll look at a story called Jesus Showed His Glory. Let's listen together. One day, Jesus led three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up on a high mountain to pray. The disciples fell fast asleep. As Jesus prayed, his appearance suddenly changed. His face was shining like the sun, and his clothes were as white as the light. The disciples woke up and saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you want, I will set up three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud suddenly covered them. A voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with who I am well pleased. Listen to him. The disciples heard this and fell face down. They were terrified. Jesus came up and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When the disciples looked up, they did not see Moses or Elijah anymore. They only saw Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus said to them, Don't tell anyone what you saw until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The disciples did not tell anyone, but they wondered what Jesus meant. They asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come before the Messiah comes? Jesus explained that Elijah had already come. That is, a prophet like Elijah had come. The people did not recognize him as a prophet and they mistreated him. Jesus said, in the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples realized Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. Jesus showed his glory to Peter, James, and John. Jesus said he would die, rise from the dead, and return to heaven. One day, Jesus will come back to earth in his glory to make all things new. Jesus showed his glory to Peter, James, and John. Mark wrote that Jesus's clothing was whiter than any person could get them, no matter how he or she washed them. Matthew explained that Jesus's face shone like the sun. It would have been an incredible sight. Jesus's glory is bright and intense, but it's more than just a light. Jesus's glory is sort of like a combination of many different wonderful things about him. His glory is the intensity of his goodness. It is the depth of his love. It is the fullness of his holiness. It is the height of his fame. It is the length of his endlessness. It is also the majesty of his power. Jesus is the greatest treasure in the world. 
And Jesus is more than a good man or a wise teacher. He is God the Son. And the Bible tells us that he is the image of the invisible God. He is the King of Kings. All things were created by him and for him. Without him, all of creation could no longer exist. And when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in his glory, they saw who Jesus really is more clearly than they ever had before. This story tells of the first time that Jesus revealed his glory to humans, but it will not be the last time humans see Jesus in his glory. When Jesus returns to earth wearing bright white clothing and shining brighter than the sun, he will destroy all evil and fix everything wrong in the world. Everyone who has faith in Jesus will receive new glorified bodies to live forever with God. That is some good news. Next week, we're going to start a new unit and we will receive a new key passage to memorize. I hope that you have been hiding God's word in your heart, friends. Our key passage helps us think about God. His plans and actions are perfect and righteous. We can praise him for doing what is best. Let's read this key passage together one more time. Lord, my God, you have done many things. Your wondrous works and your plans for us, none can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. Psalm 45. Well, friends, I hope that you have a great week and I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now. Here is our king. 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 Here is our love. Here is our God who's come.